Good morning, Booktube. Well, it is almost noon. It is 11.58 here in West Michigan. It is uh, February the 10th. It is a Saturday. And it will be noontime in about 10 minutes. I was, uh, thought I'd make a video since it's so quiet around here. My dear sweet wife is still in Grand Rapids. I called her this morning around 8.15 and she was talking to our oldest son Caleb and uh, little Josie Joy, our granddaughter, had not woke up. She was uh, probably pretty tired because now she's a big sister. Uh, this morning uh, our oldest son posted a photo of Josie Joy holding her little baby sister, Cora Lee, who was born yesterday evening. So yeah, Josie Joy is all kind of getting this whole new experience of having a little sister, having a baby now. She won't be the center of attention anymore. But I'm sure she'll do well. And uh, so, yeah, Carol didn't know what the plans were about coming home tonight or tomorrow. The weather is still winter-like. And uh, she works Monday, I think. I'm not really sure. I can't remember. But Emily is doing fine, Coralie is doing fine, Caleb's doing fine, Josephine and Carol. So that's good. Carol mentioned about us going over Monday, this coming Monday, to see Coralie. Of course, immediately I got a sick feeling in my stomach because I don't like driving when the roads are covered with snow and ice and people are sliding around and... I just don't want to die in a car wreck on some freeway. But Carol says it's supposed to be sunny Monday. Well, we'll see. Today I really haven't really read anything. I got up around 7.30, had breakfast, usually in the, in the mornings when I get up. I make coffee, either have a bowl of cereal or oatmeal, and I eat my breakfast at the computer station here. It's in the living room, and I look at news, and I look at email, and I look at booktube. And I see, I think I watched some booktube videos this morning. I was kind of out of it, so I didn't really rate, read anything, but I just got out to read this afternoon William Perkins, Volume 3, his exposition on uh, Hebrews chapter 11. See, you have the Bible, and then you go, it's in the New Testament. Now, as you're going through the New Testament, you have, before Hebrews, you have, let me see here, Hebrews, they're not, there's been debate over the centuries who wrote Hebrews. Some say the Apostle Paul, some say the writer is unknown. But, so yeah, you have Second and Tim, Second, First and Second Timothy, Titus, Philemon, and then you have epistle to the Hebrews. It says here in the introduction in this Bible, this is not a holy scripture, this is just what someone wrote to summarize what the epistle of Hebrews is about. Many Jewish believers having stepped out of Judaism to Christianity want to reverse their course in order to escape persecution by their countrymen. The writer of Hebrews exhorts them to go on to perfection. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 1. He, his appeal is based on the super, superiority of Christ over the Judaic system. 
Christ is better than the angels, for they worshipped him. He is better than Moses, for he created him. He is better than the ironic priesthood, for, for his sacrifice was once for all time. He is better than the law, for he mediates a better covenant. In short, there is more to be gained in Christ than to be lost in Judaism. Pressing on in Christ produces, produces tested faith, self-discipline, and a visible love seen in good works. Although the King James Version uses the title of the Epistle of Paul to the Apostle of the Hebrews, there is no early manuscript evidence to support it. The oldest and most reliable title is simply Pro Hebraeus to Hebrews. <laughs> so, yeah, like I mentioned in my last video, I'm I was looking at before I start this video on verse 7 of chapter 11 of Hebrews, by faith Noah being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. It's uh, I was wondering uh, if you look at the Gospels I think I was wondering if Noah is mentioned in one of the gene genealogies of Jesus, but I'm going to look at Luke. I'm just kind of curious. Oh, let me see here. Let me see here. I know they mentioned the birth line of Jesus, and I was just kind of curious. Let me see here. Yes. In chapter 3 of the Gospel of Luke, you can look at the genealogy of Jesus. Now, Jesus himself began his ministry at about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, the son of Heli. And then you get down to verse 36, the son of Cain, the son of Eperax, the son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Limic, the son of Medusala, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahulalah, the son of Cain, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. So yeah, so of all the historical personages in the genealogy of Jesus, you have Abraham, you have Noah, you have, of course, David, because it was prophesied in the Old Testament that Jesus would come from the tribe of Judah and that he would be of the of the the line of David. So that's kind of interesting because some people deny the historical flood that they just they deny that there was ever a flood and that the story of Nova is just a fable. It never really happened. Well, the problem is, if Jesus traces his own genealogy back, not only to Noah, but to Adam, then also, um, obviously Noah was an historical person. It's also interesting that Jesus mentions Noah in one of his, it's called the Olivet Discourse. It's where he talks about what will take place just before the second coming of Christ. He says, But of that hour, of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as in the days of Noah, were so will also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving marriage, 
into the day that, that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so will also be the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But, but know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So I find that kind of interesting, that, that Jesus believed in the flood. Jesus believed that the, in the great uh, Old Testament figure Noah, and that he even, if Jesus believed that the flood was an historical event, event then we can we cannot deny that the flood. Uh, I think it's also mentioned in I think in Peter. I th I'm not sure. I can't remember. Uh, I think the flood is mentioned in another place. But I haven't looked it up. <laughs> I was thinking about it. Oh, here it is. In Second Peter, now Peter was one of the apostles, the chief apostle. He was one of the twelve disciples of Christ. He says, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell, and deliver, deliver them into the chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, but did not spare the ancient world, but save Noah, one of the eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly, and delivered righteous Lot and was oppressed by the filth, who was oppressed <coughs> by the filthy conduct of the wicked. So yeah, so the the as you look in the Bible, if you want to look at what the destruction of the earth would be like, he uses uh, the example of the flood, because the as it also says in 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 Second Peter, it usually go on. It says, "But the day of the Lord." This is in chapter three of Second Peter. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. See, you're just quoting Jesus. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Looking for the hastening the coming day of God because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens, a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So when you talk about heaven, uh, people often say, well, I'm going to die and I'm going to go to heaven. Or uh, you read an obituary in the newspaper. Well, that he went to heaven. Well, heaven... As you read in the book of Revelations, it says, if you read the book of Revelations about heaven, I have I just thought I look I show you this. It says as you look in Revelations about what what is heaven? <laughs> Let me see here. This Bible is getting old. Okay. You read here in Revelations, it says here in chapter 21 of Revelations, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven 
from God prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So what you have here is that heaven comes down to the new earth. Uh, it's so what heaven heaven comes down, and that will there be one day there'll be a new heavens and a new earth. This this present physical earth will be destroyed by by fire, purified, cleansed. And then heaven will come down on this earth, and that there'll be a new earth and new heavens. So I meant, I just mentioned that because the Old Testament uses not only the destruction of, of the earth by the flood at the time of Noah, but also it uses the, the example of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. It uses the, the, the example of the destruction of the city of Jerusalem, the temple, as of what God's dying divine judgment would be like. And so that's one thing about being a Christian. You live in the light of these realities. You live in the light of the fact that this world is going to pass away. And that all these things around us that seem to be so permanent will one day be swept away by fire. And they will be destroyed. And the only thing that will count on that last day when we stand before God is our faith in Christ. And that we have been obedient as, as Noah was. It says here, like I just read in, in Hebrews 11, it says, By faith Noah being divinely warned. See, we've been divinely warned. I mean... You have been warned. We have been warned. We have been, uh, with Noah, it was probably a special revelation, a word of God. But we have the scripture. We, I just read to you God's divine warnings about the end of this world, the end of this age. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness, which is according to faith. <coughs> so we have to be moved by godly fear. And we prepare not an ark, but what we do is that we flee to Christ, who is the ark of salvation, the ark of safety. We flee to Christ, and in him we are saved that we are that we are now in Christ we have his righteousness we're declared righteous we're declared forgiven of our sins and we don't have to fear the divine judgment that on that last day we'll stand before the, the judge forgiven of all our past present and future sins clothed in the righteousness of Christ and ready to enter into that eternal state of glory, to reign with Christ forever with his angels and the elect. So, I just bring that out because you talk about reading. You talk about reading books. And, and when you watch book two, people talk about a certain book, book giving them a, a reading experience. Or they have identified with the characters. Or they have enjoyed the story. Or this book has change their perception of the world or given them a new way to view things. Well, it's the same with the Bible. The Bible, as you read it, 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 it changes you because it, it's a living word. The Word of God is living. The Bible, as it enters into us by His Spirit, it, it changes our perception and understanding of this present world and that everything is passing, that everything is transitory, and that will all that will really matter, and that will all that will last in the end, is our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all that really counts in this present life. So I just thought I'd share those thoughts with you, because I know I was kind of surprised that most people when you mention the flood, oh, there's no flood, there was no Noah, you know, that's all a bunch of hooey. <laughs>
but I just was kind of surprised that nobody made any comments because um, over the many years I've been a Christian, I've seen books against the, Noah and the Flood, and I have some books in our library about Noah and the Flood. But we de we've been divinely for, uh, divinely warned. We you read the Bible. Not only that, but God's word goes throughout the earth. I mentioned about uh, Christian missions. That I, when I was in Bible college, I was going to be a Christian missionary, and and then I realized I wanted to be a gospel preacher, and then that didn't work out. And so now I'm a 65 year old person talking into this camera, making booktube videos. And like I said, I'm reading William Perkins. I still have on my desk the works of William Perkins. I got those, and I'm still reading From Heaven He Came and He Sought Her, Definite Atonement, Historical, Biblical, Theological, and Pastor Perspective, edited by David Gibson and Jonathan Gibson. Still reading God Has Spoken in His Son, A Biblical Theology of Hebrews by Peter T. O'Brien. Still reading the Reformation Commentary, Hebrews and James. Reading God's Glory and Salvation Through Judgment of Biblical Theology by James M. Hamilton Jr. And I'm looking at this new book I got in the mail last week. This is Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, as interpreted by early Christian commentators. I got this. So I have these on my desk to read. But see, when you read these kinds of books, you just can't sit back and that you have, it's, you have, there is something required of you that you have to believe and put faith and live in such a way that, uh, it's like another verse that just comes to my mind. It says in, uh, He says, Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found in him in peace without spot and blameless. And consider that the long suffering of our Lord Jesus, the Lord, is salvation. As our beloved brother Paul, the Apostle Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, so also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they also rest the scriptures. You therefore, beloved, you therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked, but grow in grace in the knowledge of our Lord Savior. To him be the glory for now and forever. Amen. So I just thought I'd share these thoughts with you this, this afternoon. Now it's 1221 here in West Michigan on a Saturday. Hoping you're having a good weekend. And uh, till next time, bye.